Okay, we're gonna get started. Um, my name is Lauren. I am the intern and student advisory board president to the Center for Politics and the People. I want to thank everyone for being here. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Um, as a senior here studying communication and politics, women in politics is definitely an issue that I care very much about. Um, so a record number of women are running for public office in 2018, with women-focused campaign schools surging in popularity. Despite this victory, women at all levels still face obstacles and resistance. Today's panel is going to discuss the current state of affairs for women in politics, as well as what they see as um, being hopeful for the future. This event will also feature advice from people, particularly women, can talk about how their lives and leadership roles have shaped in politics. So for our panelists today, right here, uh, we have Joan Balwig, who is the state representative from the 44th 40, 41st Assembly District, located in South Central Wisconsin, covering Ripon, Wisconsin. Her public service began in Marcusan, where she served as alder person on the Marcusan City Council for four years, and then served as mayor for another six years. Currently, Joan is the co-chair of the Joint Committee for Review of Administrative Rules and vice chair of the Committee on Regulatory License Reform. Next to Joan is Gail Gitschow, who's an alum of Ripon College and president of First Tuesday. It's a political consultant and communication strategist with more than 16 years experience in both government and campaigns. She has served clients at all levels of political campaigns, from local all the way up to presidential races. Most notably in 2012, uh, Governor Mitt Romney tapped her to be the communications director for his presidential campaign. And then we have Aaron on the end. Aaron's the executive director at Emerge Wisconsin, which is an organization dedicated to inspiring Democratic women to run for office and teach them skills they need to win. Uh, before joining Emerge, Aaron served on the Waterloo City Council as the chair of the Democratic Party of Jefferson County and chair for the Democratic Party of Wisconsin's County Chairs Association. So with that in mind, I want to go into our first question, which is, why did each one of you decide to get involved in politics? Whoever wants to start. I'll start because my reason is in this room. <laughs> um, Dr. Jody Roy, uh, she was a, my uh, professor and she was my mentor and uh, she was in charge of me during my major of speech communication and I took an American Public Address with Jody and I really enjoyed the American Public Address coursework that she had where we studied speeches and um, that's how I first got my interest in politics, and then I took many other classes with Jody, and she sort of mentored me in the right direction, and then I went on to begin working on campaigns. But there are a lot of other professors in here that I have that I have very fond memories of. Um, <laughs> Colleen and Dr. Hatcher, uh, I, I'm just really excited to be back and uh, looking forward to talking with all of you, so thank you for inviting me. Okay. So, um, people maybe know or don't know that actually uh, started out, my I started out as an elementary teacher, but then my husband and I moved to Marquezan in Southern Green Lake County to buy a John Deere farm equipment dealership. And it was that involvement in local business that got me interested in what is actually happening in my community. And it was my involvement then through our local chamber of commerce that drew me to, um, uh, along with a couple other folks, try to move our city along in a more progressive manner. And because of that, several of us ran for office. And that's when I was first elected to city council. And when I, when I felt that I really wasn't making a big enough impact as being a council member, I ran for mayor, where you, can, you can't vote on things directly, but you can have impact on driving the agenda. And I served as a mayor for six years. And then our, as our business expanded and got to, wanted to spend more time with the kids because I was not able to get to everybody's basketball games and cutting out on choir concerts early and things like that, um, you know, decided to step away from politics. Uh, got involved in some other things. Um, uh, sat on the hospital board in Wapan once our, once our once our business moved to Wapan. And then there was an opening in the assembly seat. And the, the short, I'll try to make this short but funny, my husband said to me, why don't you run for that seat? Look who's running um, for that assembly seat. And I said, no, I'm happy you know, here taking care of the business and the family and we're just gonna stay with that. 
And then he came back a few minutes later. This was on a snowy Sunday afternoon. I was watching some Disney movie with my seven-year-old. And they said, and he said, well, look who's running. Why don't, why don't you run? I think you'd be good at that. And I said, no, I'm not interested. Um, don't bother me again. <laughs> and 20 minutes, half hour later, one of my friends called and said, hey, Joan, why don't you run for state assembly and I will help you. I'll be your, I'll be your um, campaign manager. And I said, well, yeah, okay. And we talked about it. And I said, I'll think about it. Another half hour later, another friend called and said, hey, I saw in the paper that this seat is open. Why don't you run for the state assembly and I'll be your campaign treasurer. So I went through uh, about a good month and a half just trying to figure out, reconnecting with people that I knew from my time as mayor and city council that had mentioned to me along the way that I should maybe think about this at some point, Mr. Lake and other people. And um, I used the Wisconsin Blue Book to research women who were already elected officials and what their backgrounds were. Uh, and I'm, one of the things that women really have an issue with, that Gail will, I'm sure, concur, women want to make sure that they're qualified to do these kinds of things. So I went through the Blue Book to see how that would really work. So to end the story, I won a nine-way Republican primary. <laughs> um, I'm, I will be running for my eighth term in the assembly. Uh, that primary, I won 27% of the vote, which is way more than I needed. Uh, my husband said that it was market differentiation because I was the only woman who was running out of that nine-person slate. I prefer to think it's because the constituency <laughs> thought I was the best one for the job. Um, and when we had a forum with nine people, they all knew if the woman said something stupid, they could get mixed up with the guys. So I think in the end, I think um, it was partially that, but because um, all along the way there have been people that have told me I should stay home and take care of my kids, but then there's also people that said, I'm voting for you because you are a woman. So I figure that kind of trades off in the end. So that's, that's how I got into politics. Um. Honestly, it, it's just sort of who I've always been, uh, even as a kid. Um, we do this exercise in a merge where you go back through a lifeline, and there were things that I didn't even realize. Like in, in first grade, I went to Catholic school, and the for First Communion, the boys got black Bible sets, and the girls got white Bible sets, and I remember being really mad. Like, <laughs> what if I, like, why can't I have the black Bible set if I want it? Um, and, and, and separately, we could, girls could wear pants or skirts, but we couldn't wear shorts which was just an outrage to me. So my mom helped me stage this culotte rebellion, um, <laughs> uh, where we like pushed it to see what we could get away with, which obviously as like a six-year-old kid, I couldn't have done on my own. So uh, shout out to my mom there. Um, but, and then I would just always sort of stayed interested as it was kind of a weird kid where I paid a lot of attention to current events. I can remember in, in elementary school, we had to draw political cartoons for something. And, I did one, uh, and they were like, eh, and I'm like, wait a minute, I've got another one. Um, so one of them was like, President H.W. Bush jump-starting the economy, now you know how old I am. Um, uh, and then um, when I turned 18, um, it was Tammy Baldwin's first run for Congress was the same year. Um, so that was the, the first campaign I ever volunteered on. Um, and uh, I learned a lot, and, um, she absolutely won. She was also in a very crowded primary for that. Um, we'll probably get to this later, but um, Wisconsin has elected three women to federal office, if you count Tammy Baldwin twice, once when she ran uh, and won that congressional seat, and once when she won the Senate, and then Gwen Moore. So all of the women we've ever elected to federal office in this state are currently serving. Um, uh, so, and then after that, as I, um, you know, Grew up, I got it really involved in, um, in the sort of campaign side for other people, uh, and had to be talked into running um, myself. And the only time I ever thought about uh, an assembly run, I was asked to, but I didn't. I did run for city council. I won. It was great. I highly recommend serving at the local level. Um, but then, yeah, it was just helping lots of other women run.
Great, so then the next question is, why do you guys think women hold back from politics and getting involved? Well, I'll start out, but I think the consultant probably has the latest facts and figures. Um, but uh, the story has to do with women need to be encouraged. And so you can hear from my story. It was my husband and uh, my friends who encouraged me and offered that support. I see that among politicians and folks in the legislature. Women need to be um, um, encouraged and supported. And men just walk up and say, you know, I'm Joe Blow and you need to elect me kind of thing. So there's a, mm -hmm. kind of a different attitude when it comes to that. Uh, traditionally, women are poor at asking for help and raising money. And the, <coughs> the, um, uh, the truth is, in a lot of cases, you need to raise money. In this particular area, you can win races by uh, just effort and elbow grease. You know, I knocked on way more doors than any of the other eight guys than, uh, that were running in my primary. So you can do that in these kinds of areas because there is no great media market, so no one's going to spend money on TV because it splits up between three different, three different media markets. So it depends a lot on your area. But first, first women need to be encouraged, and second, um, need to figure out how to... Um, raise campaign money because that's that's what you need. You need something to get the word out. I can speak to this a little bit because our our program is designed to overcome all those barriers. Um, Representative Balwick is absolutely right. Um, women need to be asked to run. We're less likely to be asked, and I don't think that that's for any nefarious reason. It's um, when people are recruiting their replacement, they tend to recruit from their own network, and our networks as human beings tend to be homogenous. So if it's mostly white guys in office, they mostly hang out with other white guys, that's who they're gonna think of first, usually, when they're thinking about recruiting their replacement. So that's part of it. Um, it's also, uh, there's still a chore gap. Women are still responsible, regardless of their relationship status, for more, um, more things at home. Um, kids or no kids, Married or not married, um, we more of that still uh, falls to us, um, and there's this perceived lack of of qualification. Um, it's and it, it's not limited to politics, but it certainly um, is is a big part of, of why women opt out. Um, there's a study cited that um, when applying for jobs, men will apply when they meet uh, six of ten qualifications, and women won't apply until they meet all ten. Um, and that, that same thing applies. We think that there must be someone more qualified to do the job, and men just don't tend to go through that same thought process. Um, you can also have sort of an offhanded conversation with a guy about um, politics or running for office, and he will hear himself having been recruited to run, where you can have a very explicit conversation with a woman, and she still won't necessarily consider herself to have been recruited. Um, so, so those things are all... <coughs> interesting, and it's not, the thing that it isn't is that um, women absolutely want to change the world. We're just more likely to go into um, C3 or charitable work to do it. Um, the political ambition gap between men and women um, starts in high school and sort of never goes away. I think I mostly agree with everything that um, my colleagues have said, but since President Trump has been elected, the women running for <laughs> office at all levels, but let me just talk about the Washington level, so, and the statewide level. So women running for the House, the Senate, and gubernatorial offices, governors of the state, have um, doubled, quadrupled, uh, depending on the party. So there's, I, I don't think that anymore it's going to be a question of, why aren't women being involved in politics? But you could have asked this question in 1992 and 1994, which was considered to be the year of the woman. But if the year of the woman is at any point, it's going to be at the most present point that we have, because the trends show that where, where we've come from and where we're going is trending up for women running for office in this country. Now, this country has come very far. There are other countries where women are not allowed to run for office, and I hope that we can at some point discuss that as well. 
because uh, that's become a, an interest of mine and a client of mine. Um, and so, so I think that we've come a, a long way, but let's just briefly touch on the Middle East. You know, women still can't go any place by themselves. Women in Jordan and Saudi, Saudi Arabia, they're just now able to drive their own, drive cars that aren't, of course, owned by them, but they're allowed to drive cars. And keep in mind, this is after we have self-driving cars in this country. So now women are able to at least drive cars in, in other countries, but that's to say, I mean, that's just the bare minimum. That's to say nothing of holding office or running a town hall meeting, which is a lot of their goals right now. So when I think about women, I think about how far we've come and how far we, we, we need to go in this country, but that pales in comparison to where we see around, what we see around the globe. So I kind of want to go off that, that, so post the election, in your guys' experience, did you see more women saying they wanted to step up and run, or do you see less women, you know, after how the um, election went? And going off that, do you guys think 2018 will be the year of the woman? I mean, I think that, that it's very clear that there are more women running um, this year than have ever run before. I don't think that it's going to, I don't think that there is a one election cycle or a one year solution. We're not going to get to parity um, in one cycle. Um, I think that we, I think that we will make gains um, and that that women's representation will improve. Um, but it's not, it, it when, when you're at 20 to 25 percent, depending on the level of office, like that is, that's just not something that flips <laughs> or gets to 50 uh, in, in one cycle. But there are certainly, there are absolutely lots more women running this year. Oh, I was just going to say that um, there's almost 400 women running for either the House or the Senate in Washington, and there's only 435 seats. So that's substantial gains in terms of candidates. Right, so there are a lot more candidates, but if you look back at history, uh, the Blue Book this year does have a special feature on women in the legislature, and it does profile those of us that are, are in the legislature, and it goes back and talks to folks that um, have um, been in the legislature. And I did bring some of these books along with some other things, but it's also available online. Uh, but if you take a look at this, um, 1925, less than 100 years ago, was the first time that women were allowed to run in the United States. Uh, and three women um, were in that first uh, assembly class, one of them coming from Watoma. They were all, uh, they were all school teachers, actually. So, so that, uh, it hasn't been all that long, and I apologize, I forgot to bring the statistics in. But um, we see a real, you can take a look at the, at the statistics on the Wisconsin Women's Council or um, National Council of State Legislatures, NCSL. Right now, um, nationally in state legislatures, 24.9% of the seats are held by women. Um, actually, if you're in the, on the East Coast and the West Coast, um, it's a little higher. <coughs> Midwest, we're right about we're right about that average. We've been as high as 35 percent in the Wisconsin legislature. We're at 25, 26 percent right now. If you go to the south, it's a little lower percentage. So you can see uh, culturally there are some you know so there are some interesting uh, dynamics going around. And if you look at some of the stepping stones that. Um, people use to get into politics. Most people don't start out running for the U.S. Senate. Most people run for their uh, local school board and city council and, and uh, county boards, uh, which if you're going to run for the state legislature, the county board is the best education of any because we push so many things on our counties. But if you look at those seats, there are some particular areas where women really flourish. I think it's well over 90% of our county clerks, county register of deeds, county treasurers, um, all of those types of positions are women, uh, where our county boards are much more dominated by the men. Same thing in um, your local boards and town boards. Um, if you go to a town board meeting, it will probably be um, five guys and one woman, 
but the, uh, the, the clerk is always going to be a woman. And the, the funny story is, when I was mayor, I was uh, sitting in at a, at, a, at a committee meeting, and I was the mayor, right? But I was the only woman in the room. And the, uh, the chairman of the committee handed me something and asked me to go photocopy it for everybody. <laughs> so, I mean, that was 10 years ago. Uh, 16 years ago. And he's long <laughs> since retired and I'm not. But anyway, it's just, you know, there is some cultural changes going on. You two ladies are in a different generation than I am. Uh, but, um, you know, I think we can see that there are changes uh, being made uh, that we are carrying on. Yes, but I'm reminded of a, a very uh, timely quote that will probably have a lot of shelf life from Margaret Thatcher when she said that if you want something said, ask a man. And if you want something done, ask a woman. <laughs> okay, so then do, <laughs> um, do you guys want to talk a little bit about why you believe it's important to have women represented, and not necessarily in the office level, but also in all sides of the political sphere? All the different roles you can play in politics. And more than happy to talk about that, um, because I think it's actually for the same reason. Um, I, I think that there, there's a group of people who get, um, there, are in, there are different perceptions about if um, you should vote for a woman just because she's a woman. And I would argue that that's not what you're doing, <laughs> and that women do bring a different perspective, uh, and that getting those different perspectives around tables where decisions are being made is how you get good decisions and how you get good policy. And so I believe that that's absolutely true for our government. Um, and I, I think that, um, you know, women's voices are underrepresented in government. They're also underrepresented in, in campaigns and politics. Um, and the, the same decision-making principles apply, I think, when you can get more perspectives uh, weighing in and um, different people with different ideas, I think that you're going to get better decisions. So... Yeah, I mean, it raises the level of discourse when you have more voices participating and when you have a, a combination of men and women at all levels, you're able to make better decisions. But, um, and also solve more problems. I think that there, there's been a number of studies internationally that show that the, the more women in, that are involved, it provides the legitimacy for the country as they tackle problems and they, make, they face tough decisions. But think about it. I mean, when you hear about a country or, or an organization, a large organization in, in this country, when they have no women represented either on their board or in any of their leadership teams, what do you think about that? I don't think it gives it much legitimacy, certainly when you're looking at other countries. And I agree with everything that the other panelists have, have said. Um, we just did a little feature on the, the day of the, the woman, and it is a, you know something that the Assembly Republican um, um, caucus did, but um, all the women that are currently in the caucus were, were interviewed, um, and some of the questions were, you know, the same, that same question. And a lot of the comments that came back were there is a different tone that women add to those conversations. Um, uh, many times it's the women who are uh, uh, actually uh, perceived and are, are looked at as being more thoughtful and diligent as far as taking a look at the entire, uh, the entire problem and looking at all sides, you know, to come up with a, a solution. So. Uh, women in general, not 100% of the time. Uh, not to say that men never um, have those those kinds of qualities also, but in general, um, it adds a little bit more, uh, um, I think, contemplation to some of the discussions. So I want to shift gears a little bit, and I'm wondering, what can men do to be better allies for women? Just be mentors. There are a lot of men that um, have <coughs> leadership positions that are perfectly capable of being mentors to, uh, to young women and to young men. But I think that when it comes to mentorship that uh, there should be more uh, men providing mentorship to younger women. Being cognizant of it when, 
uh, when it comes to things like recruitment, right? We know that women need to be asked, uh, and we know that uh, we need to be asked more than once. Um, so I think that um, thinking about asking women and talking to women and, and encouraging women um, to run uh, is important. Um, so, I mean, it's a long list, <laughs> but I think that that's a great place to start. It is a, it is a recruitment issue, and I think um, um, all of us, no matter what party we are, we're in, we're, top, we're taking a look at, you know, who's on the bench. And so that's why um, folks need to be encouraged to get in on some of the, um, uh, some of the, the learning in, um, uh, as I said before, boards and councils and, and school boards, um, because that's where I think, you know, you don't have an internship as being a politician. You know, maybe you're helping with a campaign or something, but to actually be the one on the, the front line that has to answer the questions, that has to take all the votes, there's no maybe button. You know, you have to make a decision, and you have to, you have to be, um, I think, interested enough to um, learn the topic enough that you can explain to your constituents the decision that you made and why. Um, and I think that's, that's important. So um, women aren't necessary, women in general are, want to be people pleasers, but you can't, you can't vote both ways on things, so you have to have confidence in the, um, um, what you have learned and studied on a particular topic uh, to be able to go out and talk to people. Uh, people say all the time in talking to, talking to, to folks like me, and I'm sure like, so I, like the two panelists here, how do you go in a room where you don't know anybody and you just go start talking to people and, you know, Sometimes, I did it last night at the Adams County Chamber of Commerce. You know, sometimes somebody wants to talk to you and sometimes they just kind of stare at your name badge like, yeah, you know, so then you just go on to the next one. Um, you know, in, when you're gonna do something like this, you can't, um, uh, you can't take everything so personally that it's gonna knock you down. And when people are out campaigning, um, a lot of times they need to be encouraged because there are days where people, you knock on a door and people tear up your literature and throw it in your face. Mm -hmm. So there are days that you need, um, you know, you need to be encouraged, right? And it happens to everybody, but I think, I think women, I think we take it more personally. So I want to move over to more, a maybe more personal question. And I was wondering if any of you have ever felt that there was a time during your career that you've been held back because of your gender. No. I mean, it, yes, and yes and no. I mean, there's certainly been things that I've experienced that were uh, awful and totally uncalled for and, and dumb, and I think the, the things that, that Joan said, like the, the expectation that you were there to make the coffee, or to make the copies, right? Like, those, those sort of subtle things, I don't think any of us can necessarily quantify what those all add up to. Uh, I know, uh, when I, um, I was going to, for a, uh, an appointment uh, for a city council vacancy, um, and the, the other person there had been you know, well known for um, writing a lot of letters to the editor about civic engagement and other things. He was sort of a curmudgeon, um, if we're being honest. Uh, but so we both had to give speeches to the council to, to justify why we were there and why we wanted the seat. Um, and, uh, he, he went second and he was done and then he went back and said, well, you know, I just have to say, I'm really glad there's somebody else here tonight going for this seat, even if she is a woman. Uh, and he meant it. <laughs> uh, and that obviously didn't, didn't hold me back, but it was sort of, uh, it was sort of stunning uh, and it was motivating when he ran against me again and I beat him. Um, but it was, uh, you know, I think that there, there are certainly, um, there are, are certainly ways that that exists. There, you know, there have been. There's lots of studies that have been done that show that um, even our perceptions, like you can survey a, a room with women and men speaking, and the perception will be that women have spent much more time speaking, even when it's just provably false, right? So there, there are a lot of those those really subtle things. Um, and and going back to even um, even places where 
there's a perception of feminism like the Obama administration, which I think is true. I think that that was a, they put a lot of effort into being a feminist administration. The, the women who worked there developed a deliberate amplification strategy in their meetings so that women wouldn't get talked over and, their, and our ideas wouldn't get taken, which is a thing that still happens. Um, and if they had to do it there, like there are a lot of spaces in this country that are a lot less feminist than that. Um, it's still absolutely uh, an issue. Doesn't mean that there's not, there are obviously women um, who overcome it, but I'm, I know that there are women who are still um, left behind or caught up or drop out because of it, which is unfortunate. It's a tremendous loss of talent. Well, the only thing I was gonna say is the, the mentorship, yes, but um, politics is, is a uh, knockdown, drag off, drag down, competitive sport. So when you're in a legislative body, you are competing all the time to promote your particular, your particular point, your particular idea. And you're gonna win some and you're gonna lose some. And you're gonna be the leader sometime and you're gonna be the support person sometime. So I think it is a bit of a different type of dynamic than you would maybe see in a um, uh, business climate where everyone's working on the same team to, you know, to reach the same goal, kind of, uh, that um, you know, someone wants to promote someone who's going to help them um, you know, attain their goal and be better and things like that. But I think, I think you have to remember in, in politics, um, you know, like I said, there were nine of us running in my, in my primary. Everybody thought they were the best person, right? So who was going to help you do that? And in the legislature, I see the same. I see the same thing. We work together on things, but I don't expect a male colleague to, you know, try to promote me to a particular, um, a t particular level. Uh, you know, we we get elected, and then the next week we're trying to get a leadership position or a plum um, committee position. Um, it's always something that you have to be you have to be promoting yourself in in this political realm. Okay, so I have a question actually for Erin. So your organization, Emerge Wisconsin, is all about um, encouraging women to run for office and helping them learn how to run for office. So I'm wondering if there's sort of common themes that you see come up all the time, or common struggles that a lot of women that are thinking about running for office often face. Yeah, um, I mean there are certainly. Um, things that come out. There are women who, um, we, part of what we do is also um, keep them sort of together uh, afterwards. So we have, um, I don't wanna say support groups, but kinda, um, for a while they're, while, while they're running. And I, I think that um, it is hard, it can be hard uh, for women with families, no matter how um, supportive uh, the men in their life are. I think that a campaign, it comes out the <laughs> how much of an imbalance there is uh, at home and who's actually been doing a lot of that work. Um, so that is a thing that, that we see women struggle with when they're actually running is like, is, is finding that, that balance. Um, and sometimes the women themselves didn't realize how much um, of that additional, you know, that second shift um, unpaid labor that they were, they were taking on. Um, I think that it's, um, it is about building up women's confidence. You know, we, we do a lot of practicing of, um, of public speaking. I think that women feel like um, they need to know every single thing um, before they run, which is never gonna happen um, and unnecessary. Um, so there's some talking around, talking about strategies for that, like how to, how to get the information you need when you need it so that you're not so worried now about not having it. Um, and then it, it, and then it just depends. There's also um, strategically um, where obviously our, um, the, like, w thinking about where to run and when to run and, the, and, and because most incumbents are um, men, if, to get to parity, we're either waiting for retirements or there are gonna be challengers and they're so, Dealing, sort of navigating all of that comes up fairly frequently too. 
So I want to move over to another big topic in the news right now, and I'm curious how you guys feel the Me Too or the Time's Up movement have affected you <coughs> and your career, or sort of what are your what's your read on the current climate surrounding that movement? Well, I was going to say the current movement is um, <coughs> your generation's movement. You you don't know that this has been going on for some time, and most of you don't know that um, you know we had this issue in the Wisconsin legislature um, eight years ago, and I I was um, in leadership at the time and was on the front line of. Um, having uh, one of my colleagues removed from leadership and then requesting that they um, uh, resign their seat because of their inappropriate behavior. And in the end, um, it was toward the end of session, so they didn't come anymore, and we actually replaced that person in leadership with a, uh, with a female, the first uh, female majority leader, uh, assembly majority leader in state history. Um, so this is things that people on the front line, we don't have, we didn't have Twitter then, so we didn't have a movement or a hashtag, but I think women in leadership have been fighting this, fighting this um, for a long time and trying to um, um, make sure that things have been appropriate. Um, so it's, it's not nothing new, it's not anything new, but it is, it is a different way of uh, publicizing this and working on the the idea, but this kind of thing has been been going on all along with women who are in a position like mine and women who are in leadership. Yeah, these days it just has a hashtag, but it has been going on for a really long time. Um, I think we've all been a part of or witnessed the good old boys club. Um, I think every woman has a story or knows somebody who has a story who could probably use that hashtag. Um, I've never considered myself a victim. I've handled things in my own way, uh, peer to peer. But I, uh, I am happy to see women coming forward and using their voices to get justice in the cases where justice needs to be made. Um, I was really thrilled to see uh, women coming together, both in the House and the Senate, from both sides of the aisle, in some legislation that was uh, written right after Me Too started, and so many members of the House and the Senate that were men just got taken down um, because of their behavior was now being called out. So what these women did was they came together and they said, okay, we've had enough. Um, there's also, by the way, a secret slush fund with your taxpayer dollars in it, that are used to pay off these women in damages when uh, when they get to be problems <laughs> in their offices. So uh, this was a, a secret slush fund. The Congressional Ethics Office had never made it public. They never had to. Now it has to be made public, and no more taxpayer dollars can be used for it. Not any from the members' offices, and not any from this secret slush fund. If there has to be settlements made, then it comes out of the just like anybody else, out of their personal account. So I was real happy to see that. Um, I think, it, um, I don't know that I have a, a ton to add to that. I'm, I'm um, it's been, uh, it's been a, I've personally talked a lot of women through a lot of things uh, in the last year because of my role. So it's been um, challenging um, to, to talk women through um, things that have happened and things that they're dealing with and, and for some of them decisions about whether or not to talk to the press about it or, or what to do because there is a, there is still a power imbalance. Like women do not have the same amount of power as men do and there is still fear of retaliation um, and there are still concerns about um, how people, uh, how women who speak up are treated and what, you know, if their career is going to suffer and what's going to happen. Um, those are very real fears that women, um, women still have. And so um, I'm, I am glad that it, 
happened. I'm glad that we are talking about it um, more publicly. I'm glad that it appears to be sustained uh, and that it wasn't just another flash in the pan, one news cycle story that went away. Um, I think uh, I, I was not I was not anticipating it would have the staying power that it did, and I'm I'm happy about it. It's been awful and exhausting, and I'm very tired <laughs> in, in large part because of it. Um, but I do think that um, because of all of, of those women who came forward, um, that we have an opportunity to change in a way that we have not had in in the recent past. Yeah, hopefully there's going to be fewer predators. And I think that's exactly what they are. These are people in authority who prey on victims that they have authority over. And I think that, that one of the best things to come out of this movement is um, that there will hopefully be less predators. Because let's just be very clear here that no women, no person who works in any place, not just in politics, should go to work every day feeling threatened that they're going to be harassed in some way. So it, it can't happen anywhere. So I think that this awakening is happening not only in politics, but hopefully in private companies and public companies across the country. Well, and I think that's part of what made it so sustaining and so relevant was that it it came out that it is everywhere, right? That yeah. it is not limited to one segment of society. It's a problem everywhere. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. And we, women ask, not just, not about the, necessarily sexual assaults or harassment in this way, but women ask, talk to, we talk to us about um, the sort of um, harassment women elected officials face. And what I, what I tell them in the conversation we have is, yeah, you might. There might be things that are unfair because you're a woman. You might get asked stupid questions. You might, um, you might occasionally and, you know, get a rape threat or something else really nasty. Um, but you're not immune from those things if you don't run for office, and if you do run, maybe you can do something to change it for everyone. Okay, so the last question I have is, what is your advice for the future? For women interested in running, for men who want to be allies, what's something you wish you knew, or what is your advice? Well, this is this is Erin's job, but what I would say, <laughs> <laughs> it is, and you're down to me. But from, the, from my standpoint, what I tell people all the time is uh, you need to get involved if, uh, to support folks. Um, I think the best learning is actually helping candidates. Find a candidate that you're interested in. Um, go out and uh, knock on doors with them and do parades with them and figure out how you make calls and run fundraisers and, and those kinds of things. And I think that will give someone, anyone, uh, confidence to see you know, what they can do and if there are issues that they want to get involved in. And you just learn so much as you're going through, you're going through campaigns about all the different things that, that come up. So I think that is, a, that is a great way just to get yourself involved. Uh, you can be involved as, as a campaign treasurer or, or, um, or um, handing stuff out in parades. Not if you want to hand, throw the candy out from the middle of the road, but if you actually want to hand something out to somebody and, and, and talk to them and get that um, interaction. So that's what I tell folks all the time. You don't have to be on the front line, but maybe you want to be that support person and learn how to be on the front line. Um, I would say the same thing. I want to be very clear, there's no systemic bias against women running for legislative office. When women run for legislative office, and that's anywhere from city council to the US Senate, we win at the same rate as men. Um, so there are things we have to deal with and there are absolutely barriers, um, but for legislative office, voters aren't one of them. Um, so I think we, we rightfully focus on some of the sexism and other bad things um, that can and do happen. Um, but that is a place where it's not, it's not real. There's, and I think there's still a perception of it um, because some of the high profile things we see women go through, we assume that it's like that um, all the way down and it's just not. There have been tons of studies that have shown um, that, that is, that's not the case. Um, 
And I just, I, I really encourage women to run and run for local office, get involved um, in your community. Be, serving on city council was amazing. I learned a ton, I felt great. I felt like I really um, was able to, to give back um, and do a lot of good things for my, um, for my community. Um, but the, and then again for men, like, I'm not saying don't run, but like, think about it. Think about it. Think about what you're doing um, with your power, and if there's maybe someone else um, with a different perspective uh, who has something to offer uh, that you don't, um, and just think about it. Um, there's actually a sort of tongue-in-cheek, can you not pack, uh, uh, who, who offered to provide that service, and just like when they saw dudes piling in uh, to, to races to just ask them, can you not? Can you, can you not? Um, but certainly, um, more probably realistically than that, um, I know that you know women in your life who you think should run for office. Tell them that and talk to them about it and encourage them to run. So, in terms of advice, the advice my mother always gave me was leave the, leave the place better than you found it. So, I always keep that to heart. My advice to young women who are thinking about getting into politics or any profession in any part of their life, in any country that they're living in, is two things. The first one is when you get knocked down, get right back up. And the second thing is never let anyone tell you no. And that's it. All right, I want to thank our panelists. Um, before we move into audience questions, um, I want to remind everyone that we have a, we do have another event coming up. It's going to be on February second at fourth, or not February, excuse me. Um, talking, it's going to be on April second, um, talking about uh, the environment and how it relates to Wisconsin, and that's going to be at four thirty in here. Um, and additionally, if you want to stay updated on all of our events, we do post everything on social media. So you can go to our Facebook page, which is Ripon College Center for Politics and the People, or you can follow us on Twitter at Ripon College CPP. We always make sure to get our events posted on there. Um, but with that in mind, I do want to turn it over to audience questions. Yeah. Uh, this is a question for Gail. You mentioned how inspiring it was to see the women in the Senate uh, and the House come together across party lines to confront the predators. I'd like to build on that. Do you think if there were more women in the U.S. Congress, we would have less of a stalemate? Because I think of Senators Murkowski from Alaska, Senator Collins from Maine, uh, Senator Kelly from the state of Washington, Senator Klobuchar, they seem to be working across the aisle a lot. Now, maybe that's anecdotal, but you're closer to it than I am. Do you think if there were more women like that, they would find ways to do bipartisan work rather than the rigid ideological positions that we're in now with the men? Yes, sir. That's exactly right. I think that if there were more women in the Senate, um, or if there were women running the world, it would work better. But um, <laughs> honestly, when it comes to solving problems, when women from all points of view get together to solve a problem, um, I, I always see that it, it works itself out instead of having government shutdowns and um, you know endless stalemates. Debate is great. Don't get me wrong. You know, having a debate is how this country makes all of its decisions. But I think that adding the women's voices in there um, legitimizes the debate, first of all. And then also, there, the voices raise the level of discourse in coming up with whatever solution is possible. And I just want to say it's not, it's not anecdotal. Like, it seems anecdotal, but there, there are studies that bear that out. Um, women in the legislature get more, get more done. They get more legislation done. Um, they get more gender salient legislation done, which is different. But going back to that, the in the Wayback Machine, the, the women of the Senate have forestalled multiple government shutdowns. They've gotten together, worked on things, gotten stuff done. Um, and it there's a, a good amount of data saying that that's that you are correct. Joey. Yeah. Um, I have so much. And I do know that there are some studies about the way that women will uh, improve the communication situations, of which Congress is one. Uh, we'll, we'll be, at times, more cooperative in terms of orientation problem solving, and that 
backing those certain kinds of, of decisions along. Uh, I'm bothered a little bit by what, to me, at times sounds like stereotyping men on the panel as well as women. Um, because I personally know a lot of women, including some at the front of the room, who would not be afraid or need to be asked to do something. So some of the allness, I guess, bothers me. That, that being the case, you're on topic. This is a panel about women in politics, okay? But I want to fault you for being on topic. With that said, though, um, because the questions are all about women in politics, the answers are about women in politics, but do you actually believe that gender is the, the issue of primacy here? Is it gender? Is it party? Is it socioeconomic background? Is it business versus legal orientation? So in your experience working with this, and Aaron, yours is a little bit different because of the nature of the organization, but is gender the primary issue at play in what you're talking about in your experience? Let me go first, because I already had to defend my thesis. <laughs> um, I don't think that it is. No, but let me say a couple of things. So yes, the, the allness of it is it, it sometimes bothersome to me as well. Because let's just, for example, this Me Too debate, another, another victim or group of victims of the Me Too movement are really good men. And these are men that know how to treat women. These are men that want to be mentors for the right reasons. And they're men like Dr. Hatcher, who, you know, they're being dragged down because of the bad behavior of a few of them or many of them, however many, but men are being dragged down too. But to go back and answer your question, Jody, is I don't think it's gender that's the, the primary concern here. I think it's the how polarized everybody is, and especially in recent years. I mean, you go back after, you see the, the administration and you know what the political environment is now, which is the reason that so many women are running. I mean, look if you look at 2016, and the number of women that ran before 2016, it pales in comparison to the women, mostly Democratic women, who are stepping up because they want their voice to be heard. They want to run against whatever they're choosing to run against since 2016. And I think what they're running against the, the party system um, and things that they don't like that's coming out of Washington. Everybody hates Washington. Uh, that's the that's the perfect villain. When I talk to candidates about running against something, it's run against Washington, you'll win. Um, <laughs> but I think it's how polarized everything is. Uh, people are not working together. We've seen an unprecedented amount of government shutdowns, and that's people who just can't come together and, and work um, on this on to solve issues. But uh, I, I do think that moving forward from here, there's going to be a wave because there's always a wave. You know, we had some bipartisanship under the W. Bush administration. We had some more partisanship. I mean, you look back now at President Obama and President Bush, and you think, those are the good old days. <laughs> Can you even imagine that? I mean, I, 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 it's hard to see that, and maybe it's because everything is so publicized now. Um, there's a 20, there's like a, I don't know, if there are more than 24 hours in the day, that would be the amount of news cycle, news coverage there is. Um, and of course you have all of the social media. But I, I do think that uh, it's gonna swing back because it always does. There's a wave that comes you know, from, from being too bipartisan to the parties wanting to go back and take care of their bases to swinging back and being hopefully bipartisan again. Um. I think that it, the, the talking about women as a monolith is frustrating to me too, but it, it, we, we speak in generalizations um, in part because that's what, the, what we have for, for data, right? Um, and because of the, the topic at hand. And, and I, I think going back to, to what I opened with or said earlier, it's not, about, um, it's not about being a woman. I don't think that women are inherently better uh, than men, I do think we're underrepresented. I do think we fundamentally walk through the world with a different perspective and that that perspective, those perspectives are therefore underrepresented at decision-making tables. Um, and I think that's a problem, but I, I don't limit it to women. I think that representation matters. 
um, beyond, well beyond gender, um, into other um, things and characteristics and sort of identities, God forbid, um, that impact people's lives. Um, and I think that representation matters goes beyond politics into um, into media, into the business world, into um, it's harder to be what you don't see. Um, so I think that um, gender is a an easy place to start um, because there are like pretty pretty clear lines. You've got about half of the population are mostly one or the other, um, and one of those groups is vastly overrepresented. Um, in a system of government that, by its nature, is supposed to be representative. Um, so, there <laughs> is my answer to that question. No, I, I I agree that you know clearly the numbers you know show that women are underrepresented. I can say from my time in the legislature that there are a lot. There is not just a Republican and a and a Democratic caucus. There is also the urban versus rural, which is which is, uh, has nothing to do with R's and D's. It has to do with the interests of your, your constituency. So there are, yeah, there's the, the urban and rural and you know, all of those things also are your different constituencies. And you know, based on that, um, if, you look at a, if you look at a district that has a lot of rural people and urban people, you know, you're probably gonna see those uh, you can see someone from the urban area, you know, probably, you know, come up. Uh, but I have to give credit to um, the organization that Aaron works for. Does a great job of trying to, you know, make that encouragement. And overall, uh, if you look at R's and D's on uh, women in the in the Wisconsin legislature, over time, it's it's pretty much even. Um, but um, there were more women who were Republican back in the older days, and there's more D's now. Um, but I think part of that is you have to look at the women that are coming forward, that a lot of the, the women that I see um, that are stepping up have had the whole, are from this generation that are thinking of being, um, being in politics as their life's career. And I think um, on the other side of the aisle, men and women, generally, you're seeing folks that are doing as their second or third career. I think there's a, a little bit of a different mindset in um, who's coming out to run, period, between, between R's and D's is what I've, you know, what I've seen also. So there are, there are some other dynamics going on also, as well as the Male, female. Okay, Lizzie. Um, so you guys, this is kind of a follow up on her question. So you guys all mentioned that like women need to be asked and they need to be encouraged. And um, I am obviously of a different generation, and I could not imagine needing to be asked or encouraged. <laughs> um, I think like Lauren would probably agree with that statement. But when and like where did you guys get this from? Like, when do you think this happens to women that their mindset changes and they need encouragement and need to be asked? Oh. I don't feel like I need to be asked to do anything. Um, I mean, I, I just never have, and that's mostly gotten me in trouble. <laughs> yeah, all right. I mean, it's even with like pizza, when they're supposed to say no to pizza the first time they're asked, I say yes every time. <laughs> we are going to go We are. Uh, I would, um, Jennifer Law, um, or Jennifer Lawless and Richard Fox are sort of the, have done sort of the seminal research on this, and I encourage you to check that out. For me personally, I, um, used to be young, um, I'm about to be, I'm about to turn, I turned 38 this week, and it's weird to, like, start not being young anymore, um, but something that actually was pretty shocking for me, um, was I felt like I was treated, I, I was raised in a house, I have two, two sisters, um, um, my, people would ask my dad things like, oh, don't you wish you had boys? And he was like, no, I do not wish that. Why would you say such a thing, right? Um, he took us fishing, he, right? Like he, um, I was, and I was raised to believe that I could be 
anything I wanted to be. My mom, obviously, going back to the Kulat Rebellion, it was very encouraging of me in all things. Um, and we are at a point um, in history where women are starting to do better in school. Um, more women are going to college. More women are getting advanced degrees. I've got a whole other conspiracy theory on that later. Um, but, uh, so, but coming out of that and going into the real world and getting a job, um, and starting to actually experience sexism that I had sort of been told didn't exist anymore um, was shocking to me um, and not great. Um, and, and so I, 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 that's not, um, I don't think that that's it for everyone. Um, and I certainly um, was not scared of leadership in other ways, but I did have to be asked to run for office. Um, and I didn't know at the time how common it was for women because my immediate response was, oh, there's gotta be someone more qualified than me to do that job. I don't know every single issue that's coming before the city. I haven't paid that much attention to the budget. Like, I don't know. I was on the plan commission. Like, I was good. I knew, like, I had a, I had a, a job in the housing industry. Like, I knew what I was talking about, and I still um, thought that there had to be someone better um, for the job. So I hope, I would love it if, um, it stuck with your generation and, and that it was not a thing anymore. But we'll, I guess we'll find out. Okay, we have time for one more. For, oh, did you want to? No, I was gonna yeah. say I agree. I think yeah, things are changing, but we're taking a look at what the studies have said and what the history has been. So I think, yes, your generation is going to continue um, seeing that movement. And as I said before, um, I see a lot more uh, younger women thinking about this as a, a career that I have before. Yes, last question. Mm -hmm. Listening, there's one word that I have not heard mentioned yet today, and that is the role of the voter. And does anybody have some insights into, do men vote for men, do women vote for women? How many cross votings happen? And what influence does that have on the issues that we've been discussing today? I mean, it, it just depends on the, it just depends on the election cycle. So let's just, okay, you're gonna make me remember numbers. Um, let's just go back to 2016. So there was a woman running against a man. And women leading up to the election, I would say in the last three months, hey. Don't write this down, I'm not completely sure. <laughs> <laughs> No, generally, I'm accurate here, but <laughs> I believe it was the last three months um, where women just started to pull away from Hillary Clinton, and it wasn't because they loved Donald Trump. Trust me, it wasn't that. It was because they didn't trust her. So it depends on the election cycle. You know, it, it, it doesn't. Let's look at if you look at President Obama versus Mitt Romney. I know that race really well. I should have done that one, but. Um, uh, women wanted to go to President Obama because they knew who he was. He was an es established quantity to them. Um, and President Obama spoke to, quote, their issues during that race more. Um, but issue sets change, voters' mindsets change, um, the candidates certainly change. So I would just say, de dependent on the election cycle, what's happening in the world, that's, what, that's where the gender divide comes from. Um, you would think that in the last election, and we see this in statewides all the time, but in, in the national level, when uh, women started leaving Hillary Clinton, it was because of trustworthiness. Now, Donald Trump is not right that he won women. He didn't win women. Um, he says that, but he did not. Um, there were some pockets of the country, the Deep South, the Midwest, where he did end up winning women because the hatred for Hillary Clinton was so deep that it was the only place for them to go. So they came up with reasons to vote for him, like he's gonna elect a, or he is going to appoint a Supreme Court justice who is going to follow my, um, my conscience when it comes to Supreme Court issues. So I, I don't know if I answered your question. Mm -hmm. But just going back, there's no, um, there is some bias against women in executive office, um, voter bias. Um, it's hard to calculate exactly how much it is, but there is none that's been able to be shown with legislative office. So it is harder for women to get elected to office than it is for men, still. And I think it's because of some problematic views we have as a society about women's leadership and, 
and viewing executive as, as different, executive leadership as different than um, the sort of legislative communal leadership. Um, having said that, um, right in, in where we are right now, um, voting decisions are heavily, heavily, heavily tied to partisanship. Um, so most people are partisan, whether they will admit it or not, and most people vote that way all the time or don't vote. Um, so it is, I think this year it may be um, an issue that there, there, will, there may be pockets of voters who are inclined to vote for women because they are women. Um, I, it, we'll have to see what the data says after, after the cycle is over, but typically um, it's not a thing. And for legislative, it's not, that women are more likely to face a primary um, and to be, to come out of a primary uh, than men. Um, but other than that, for legislative, um, voters don't have a bias toward, for or against women. And in general, especially in areas like this, it is um, the best candidate usually wins. And recruiting is very important to that, that whole process. So um, you want to get to know that person. You want to trust that person. You mentioned Hillary. You know, you, if you trust that person, if you know that person, um, it's the person. It's not the, the male or the female. And in the end, all politics is local. Uh, people hate Congress but love their congressmen in general kind of thing. And so that, that is also the power of the incumbency because you've seen that person, that person has maybe helped you out to get your driveway permit or you know, um, uh, got a bill passed because you wanted to put ATVs on the road. You know, that's the power of the incumbency you know, because you have served those, those local people. And we've seen cases where um, politicians at all levels forget to, to be at home and talk to local people that they lose. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, uh, we have um, uh, what's so difficult now about primaries. We've seen examples where uh, people go so far to the end to win the primary, they're unacceptable to the general population, right? We've seen that in, in several cases. So in the end, it's, it's about knowing the person that you want to, um, want to vote for. And one reason I asked that question is April 3rd, Get registered and vote. <laughs> the and I didn't want to. And I didn't want to say that I did bring some extra blue books and maps, and I do have some little cards there for uh, all my contact information. And I passed out to everybody here. Since you're in a post office box, you don't get this. But I'm going to be back on campus in three weeks for one of my listening sessions, and they're all on this also. So this is something that goes out to kind of give people in the area an idea of what's been happening in the legislature over the last year. So I encourage, I'd love to have 50 people come to my listening session and ask me really hard questions. <laughs> Joan, you've been in the legislature for 18 years. 14. 14, 14 years. 14 years. And, uh, who aspires to be majority leader or speaker or governor? And even if you don't, if you did, would it be more difficult for you because you're a woman? I've uh, I mentioned before that the day after you get elected in the legislature, you immediately are considering either running for a leadership position or you're getting uh, tons of phone calls to do that. I've run for leadership. I've won some and I've lost some. Um, so I ran for majority leader and lost, um, but I did serve as uh, uh, caucus chair for a couple of terms during probably the most contentious times. I mentioned the, the time we had to get rid of our majority leader, um, and then also uh, Governor Walker's first term was you know pretty turbulent. So I've won some and I've lost some, and at this point. Um, I've always said you don't have to be in leadership to be a leader. And so I've decided that my talent should be better used to just do a lot of work. So I expect to have 20 bills signed into law this year, which is a lot. 
Um, I'm you know, heading up uh, special, um, special groups and committees and do study committees. And I'm on, I think, eight standing committees. So my goal at this point is just to learn a lot, know a lot, and have influence on what we're doing in a lot of different in a lot of different areas and we'll just see how things go whether whether um, you know if I win this November again and decide on November 5th that I'm going to run for a leadership position so we will just wait and see. All right I want to thank everyone for being here um, just a reminder too after this we are having a small reception at Roadhouse Pizza so if you plan to come by go to the second floor um, but can we give a round of applause for all our wonderful people.